It's time to embrace your inner O. Join GL Datus on his spiritual, personal development and self-help journey to enjoy a more vibrant and purposeful life with help from some of the world leading authors and experts in the mind, body and spirit field. So sit back, relax and enjoy the O People podcast. Find your inner O with the O People podcast. Hello, my name is Gavin Lee Davis, your host on this journey to find your inner O. O people are incredible people that are on a journey of discovery. O people have tapped into spiritual enlightenment, ancient teachings, motivational, inspirational energies, and have expanded their consciousness to embrace so many wondrous possibilities. The O people are here to guide us, to support us, and help open our minds and embrace the life we have been given. These are people that have learned to make positive changes, and some of these people have suffered tremendous ordeals of pain, loss, grief, and depression, but have reached for the light and become stronger for it. You too can find your inner O with the love, the teachings, and experiences that these O people give you. Anyone can be an O person, and these authors, motivators, and teachers will help you find self-love, inspiration, and empowerment. Welcome to the O People podcast and your journey to find your inner O. For more information on our O people and their work, visit www.o-books.com. And if this series motivates or inspires you, please visit our Patreon page and tip us one dollar or one pound to support the series. And I will put you into a prize draw for a chance to win an O book every month. So visit www.patreon.com forward slash O people podcast. That's www.patreon.com O people podcast. Please support us. It will mean so much to keep this series running. My guest at this time will guide us on a journey that spans time and generations. This is a journey of mental health, Nazi eugenics, a world in chaos, the light of spirituality and paranormal encounters. Sylvia True is the author of Where Madness Lies, the story of her Jewish grandmother's mental health illness during the Nazi eugenics program in Germany nearly 100 years ago, a time when those of mental health would be cleansed and eradicated. Sylvia True and Where Madness Lies explores mental health and a family's journey of survival and asks, is madness hereditary? This is an incredible journey that has spanned generations and its message is as important to us now more than ever. This is Sylvia True, and this is Where Madness Lies. I would like to welcome to this very, very special episode, the wonderful Sylvia True, the author of Where Madness Lies. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, Sylvia. Thank you for having me. Where Madness Lies, the fantastic book, by the way, really really can't recommend enough that people read this, is a story about the high price of repression in Nazi Germany. How does this link you to your grandmother and to your own family? As you know, I think repression leads to sometimes behaviors that we don't necessarily want to display. Uh, My grandmother had to flee Germany, and a lot of what happened to her there was extremely traumatic, and I think she repressed a lot of those circumstances. And in so doing, I think there was a lot of roiling of anxiety inside of her and it came out in different ways, maybe to like to control everything. She used to make sure every single clock in her house went off at the exact same time. So there was so much in her life she couldn't control. You know, her sister's health, the Nazis, obviously, so many circumstances. And so I think she repressed a lot of the pain and tried to control things she could. And it made her a pretty rigid person in a way. And then I think that kind of repression also gets passed down. It was in a way it was passed down to my mother, who also had a certain amount of anxiety and depression, and she she repressed it, and then it was passed down to me. So I do think repression is something that gets passed down, and this book is all about coming to terms with that and finally reflecting on the past and on the pain and being willing and brave enough to open up about it so that you can move forward 
and I know this sounds cheesy, but that you can move forward in a state of love. That is, so the book sort of goes from, in, in a way, follows a journey from darkness to light. For our younger viewers and listeners right now who may not be familiar with what happened in that tragic part of our history, could you give us a little bit of detail about how the Nazis treated those with mental health issues back in the 1930s and 40s? So it actually started, actually began in around the 1920s. There were two famous, one was actually a lawyer and one was a psychiatrist, Binding and Hoch, and they believed in what they call life unworthy of living, right? So they believed that we should get rid of the disease to make the race stronger. This was really much more of a, almost a biology concept than anything else. Right. And in the 20s and you know, early 30s, there were many societies all around the world, many eugenic societies who had this had very similar beliefs here in America. Sterilization laws were put into place in many different countries. Again, Germany, of course, took everything to the extreme, I think, the Nazis, I should say. And in 1933, they came up with the one their sterilization law in which doctors and family members could sterilize people with mental illness, but that was considered feeble-mindedness. I mean, there was a huge, broad range of things that could fit into that category, even alcoholism, you know, deafness, blindness, obviously schizophrenia, uh, manic depression. And so they actually sterilized 400,000 people from, I think, 1934 to 1939. The goal, again, was to rid the country of any kind of disease, especially mental disease. So it didn't matter what race you were at that point, but that was the beginning in 33, certainly with the sterilization laws. And it was all tied to eugenics. I mean, the people were sterilized here in this country as well. And then, of course, as things, you know, moved forward, then they started murdering the mentally ill. And that was really the opening act to the whole genocide. I mean, doctors, you know, they use their techniques for gas chambers, crematoriums, even pillaging bodies. All of that was sort of practiced in the mental hospitals. There were six sanatoriums where the killings took place. So yeah, they didn't treat them very well. No, and this is something that is very real to you, where Madness Lies may be wrapped in a fictional style to it. It is still very much based on the tragedies and the terrifying moment in history for your family. If you don't mind, I know it's very personal to you, could you just give us a little bit more details of how this affected your family personally? Sure. I think to start with, now I'll start with my grandmother. So my grandmother was raised in Frankfurt in Germany. She was from a very wealthy family. She adored her younger sister. And the picture you have up there, I don't know if people can see it, is actually of my grandmother and her younger sister. And her younger sister's name was actually Rigmore. That name was not changed in the book. It's a family name and I liked it. So in Frankfurt in Germany, in during that time, she tried to help her sister who was mentally ill. And I mean, she was, my grandmother was a very, very bright, dynamic woman. And she did everything. She researched, she, you know, they went to the best doctors. And eventually, because of what was happening in Germany, because of the whole eugenics movement, you know, because people really believed, you know, this didn't, ha again, she was Jewish, but this, this particular thing didn't have to have to do with being Jewish, they really believed that it was would be merciful to put people out of their misery. So things went poorly in Germany. She fled to Switzerland. And to sort of stay safe, if I can say it like that, she believed that her daughter had to show all the time that she was perfect and healthy, right? No, you could not show weakness. She's showing weakness was incredibly dangerous because of what happened to her sister. So, of course, you know, children take this on. My mother took that on. Like, she didn't know why exactly, but my mother certainly felt like, oh, my God, I have to be perfect all the time. I can't show any weakness. And it made my mother very anxious, who interestingly dealt with it by becoming a skater, a figure skater. And she was Swiss national champion skater, in fact. And I think her way of dealing with any kind of anxiety and depression was through 
physical movement. And, you know, in many ways it worked very well. But that same idea of you must be perfect and healthy, you know, and which is kind of the whole, you know, Aryan race thing too, right? You know, you, you can show no flaws. And that was passed down, of course, to me and my siblings. And it was very difficult for me because I, from a very young age, although I didn't know it at the time, also suffered from depression. And so it was a, it was a huge struggle to, to always be like, okay, I have to be perfect. I can't be upset. I have to be fine, you know, all the rest of it. And then eventually, after I had my first child, um, the combination of a postpartum depression and a lifelong depression landed me in a mental hospital. And I'm not ashamed of that at all. It was probably one of the greatest growth experiences of my life. And through that experience, in the way in which my mother and my grandmother eventually came to help and support me was through their reflection of really my grandmother's reflection of what happened in her life and through her revealing the secrets that were the undercurrents of our family that that caused so much anxiety. And once you let go of that, and you are really free. I mean, there was a freedom that came with all of this. You know, yes, there's pain, but there was tremendous growth. And, and then you end up being close too. So it kind of ends up being a beautiful thing. I very much appreciate your honesty and being authentic about your own mental health issues. We are blessed to live in an era where we can discuss on an open platform that we have had struggles and how we've overcame them. And I very much appreciate that being bipolar myself. Right. And that's where I see huge equity in where madness lies. It talks about what was and what is now and how very different the world is today and how we can actually support each other. And I think your book, Where Madness Lies, is a huge part of that process. And I have to ask from doing a bit of digging, your grandfather was the doctor of Anne Frank's family. Is that correct? So as it turns out, both my parents lived in Frankfurt in Germany. They didn't actually, they they sort of knew of each other, but my mother's family was very like, you know, aristocratic. My father's family was more of the intellectual Jewish academics. And my grandfather on my father's side was the doctor of the Frank family. And that's before they fled to Amsterdam. My grandfather was, and I remember him well, they fled to, to um, England. He was such a kind, wonderful, sensitive human being. And he just never believed, he did not believe that that the world would end up where it ended up and he actually had to sort of get pushed literally physically pushed onto a train to get out because he just didn't believe it was going to end up as badly as it did thank thankfully he had this cousin who made him and my um, father's family flee so they were they were okay they ended up in England but my story with my struggles with mental illness it's really really important to me not only because of the freedom that I felt but you know, I'm a teacher. I teach um, high school students. I'm a chemistry teacher. And I feel that it's really important to share with them. And yes, we have come a long way. But it's interesting now, during this pandemic, different students are struggling in different ways. You know, students who might have been our, some of our strongest students in the school are now having real anxiety and depression around what's going on. And it's interesting to me we have great school counselors but it's still very whispered about you know it's still like oh we have to talk about Johnny and you know and I, I'm not saying they should be shouting about it obviously we want to you know we don't want to we want to be mindful and not embarrassed but it's still there's still there's still a certain amount of shame involved in you know it's still a certain amount of shame when people talk about it you know it's not like a broken arm or even diabetes I mean we treat those things we don't question those things so Yes, we've come a tremendous way, and it's great, you know, that I, I have no shame in talking about it. But it's very important to me for my children, but also for my students, that they understand there isn't shame in this, and we're here to support each other. I'm kind of carrying on from that. I read your fantastic article in Psychology Today. Oh, thank you. Is mental health something we inherit? Well, it's funny. When I went to college forever ago... 40 years ago. Yeah, more than 40 years ago. Oh, my God. Does that age me? You must have been uh, about two, Sylvia. Yeah, I was two. I, I, yeah, I was very advanced. We were taught 
and I remember this so well, we were taught that, you know, who you are is about 80% environmental and about 20% genetic. Now, if you think about that now, most people would say, no, 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 you know, and I can't put in, nobody can put an exact percentage on it, right? I mean, we don't know, but I would say, certainly, we know now that much more is inherited, right? And I mean, looking at my own family history, it's clear that, you know, depression and anxiety runs through my family, my daughters in, inherited it very differently, interestingly. One daughter is much more on the anxiety end and the other daughter is much more on the depression end, but both treated in very healthy and, you know, thriving lives. So I absolutely believe that there's a pretty significant um, genetic component. That being said, there's a huge environmental component as well. I mean, you know, the traumas you grow up in or don't grow up in, you know, are going to affect your mental health. So, yeah, I think a lot of my mental health was inherited and a lot of, well, a, a lot of the support I got in the environment, that was a huge positive thing. So if I wouldn't have gone to McLean, I don't think I would have survived. So, yeah, I think it's, I can't give you a number, but let's say 50-50 at least. I fully endorse what you're saying because I believe a lot of my mental health, particularly the depression and suicidal tendencies, I've inherited, whether it was through seeing behavior and absorbing that behavior or whether it was genetic. And then for me, it was twofold because I was, I'm from the era, the environment where you couldn't talk about mental health. Right. You know, bipolar was, was labeled manic depressive and there was terms used for that behavior as that guy's a nutter. He's a weirdo. He's weird. He's not right. You know, there's something loose with him. So you hide that away and try and paint a picture that everything's OK. And from there, you create a persona that you live in that everything's all right. While inside, everything's rotten to the core. Everything is just falling to bits. Now, kind of moving on a little bit from the mental health aspect, there's something I'm really interested. We get a little deeper as we go in, okay, right? You have a strong belief in the paranormal. And there is one person in Where Madness Lies who has visions. It is clear that these are paranormal visions. Is that what you hope the reader will think? I do hope the reader will think that, but I... I don't believe that all the readers will. I think I wrote it in a way that's clear that her visions are pretty accurate. There were a number of, of reasons I included her in the story. Obviously, one is that I am a huge believer in the paranormal because of experiences I've had. And I also thought it really... So Inga, who's the protagonist, who's based on my grandmother, right, who went through this terrible time during World War II and then afterwards, I mean, for everything she lost. And I think she kind of shut down after, you know, fleeing from Germany not not shut down in every way. She was a still vibrant woman. But I think her, her mind closed, you know, and she repressed a lot. And I think what this character does is it pushes, it pushes Inga to open up a little bit and to say, huh, you know, because the character clearly has a vision of Rigmore that Inga can't deny that that is what she, you know, that is what Cece, this character, saw. So it Again, it pushes against those boundaries and pushes Inga to, to say, huh, I wonder if there's anything in that and makes her open up a little bit. And so the book is really all about opening up, opening up about the past, opening up about repression and being being open minded in the end is what I hope the reader gets. So I, I think it's pretty obvious that her visions were real, but certainly people might think, no, she was just crazy. Certainly there were many people who were put in mental hospitals who had visions or heard voices. And, I, and again, you know, I'm not going to say everybody who hears voices or has visions is seeing the other side or the spirit world. But certainly there are people who were clearly put into hospitals who weren't, I don't believe, mentally ill at all, who clearly were connecting with the spirit world. And it's very interesting to me to look at other cultures because, you know, in some cultures, if you you're blessed or gifted with this, you know, ability to see, you know, you're, you rise to become a shaman, you know, and I also spend a lot of time in Peru in the jungle. 
and I take my students there to do research in the summers, although we haven't gone obviously last summer and we won't go this summer, but you know, and I try to teach them a, a little bit about some of that culture, which is so different. I mean, there they believe the wind and the river and the trees, they all have spirit. You know, and I try to teach my students, if a family in Peru, you know, gets sick and they might think, well, the, I, I got sick because this other family put a curse on me, right? The police will actually investigate that. And in our culture, we would think, well, that's absurd. That's crazy. They're crazy to think that that's you know, who's to say what's crazy? And I mean, that's sort of also a huge part of the book. Like, who's to say what is actually crazy? Was it crazy for me to feel all this in depression after, you know, year after generations of people like making everything inside and pushing everything down? There's there's a point where it's it's going to all boil up and come out. And once that does ha happen, you know, that can be a beautiful journey, you know, which it was for my family. Once, you know, once these secrets were revealed there, you know, there was an openness that was allowed that took us again. I know that sounds corny, but took us into the light a little bit. Not at all. As a paranormal researcher and or for myself, there is this ambiguity between mental health and the paranormal and where does one start and the other end and it's very difficult for us in the west right. to give a clear-cut answer but because of our own belief systems you and I have to be very careful of is that individual getting the right support you can't say to someone who's having profound spiritual uh, encounters you need to see a doctor but at the same time, if you don't tell someone who may have very real mental health issues to go to the doctor, there might be some very real damage. Whereas in other cultures, it is very acceptable that you see your ancestors, you see spirits, you see and right. communicate with them. And it's very, very difficult for us in the West. And I hope in our lifetime there is more acceptance. So why did you add this paranormal layer to the book? What was your motive for this? It's pushing that boundary of being open minded, I think. I think that I th uh, one of my favorite quotes is only a closed mind is certain. I, I think that adding this dimension was really important to me on a number of different levels. One, of course, the open mindedness and that the characters be open to each other and open to listen to each other. And that's sort of the basis for healing. The other is I do, you know, because I have a strong belief in the paranormal, I do believe I uh, uh, I had, you know, some of my grandmother's help when I was writing this book. I mean, I didn't have it directly as some people, you know, what's that called? The writing? Oh, I can't think. Automatic writing. You know, I didn't have that, unfortunately. <laughs> I wish I did. It's also, I guess, I, yeah, I keep pushing the boundaries. I grew up in a very scientific family who, you know, they were totally against any of this. You know, oh, my God, that's crazy. That's nonsense. That can't exist. And I sort of believed that it was it was after I got out of McLean when I was feeling well for the first time. And when I wanted to experience more of life, I met someone who introduced me to a psychic. And I was, of course, I was like, that's ridiculous that, you know, that's nonsense. I'm sure this person doesn't know anything, but I was intrigued. And I mean, my first visit kind of blew me away. I was like, how did she know that? And, you know, part of my science brain was like, did somebody tell her, blah, blah, blah. But there were things that, that nobody could have told her that she knew. And that was like the beginning of my journey, um, which was has been a fascinating journey and is actually what I'm writing about in my next book. Uh, after, you know, I saw her for over 30 years. Unfortunately, she died about a year ago. And that's you know, that's been a, a huge loss. But, you know, through her, I started wondering about that mediumship and past lives. And again, looking at other cultures, you know, in, in India, people know that, you know, there are past lives and sometimes they connect them to a child, remember certain things from, you know, a family, a past family they lived in. They actually try to go and find and meet the family and Nobody thinks twice about it. Nobody says that's crazy. Have you had any detailed or memorable paranormal experiences or visions in your own life? So what I ha I've had, I mean, I, again, sadly, I'm not much of, I, I wish I was more whatever psychic. I do have psychic dreams. I have had a number of those. 
And at first I just thought, well, that's weird. I just dreamt about the exact same thing that was going to happen. And I, I don't think that's uncommon. Now, the more I've learned, it's interesting. I used to teach a course in the high school I work in called Science in the Media. And the fun thing about this course is it wasn't based on, you know, it wasn't your typical textbook science course, right? It's not like what I have to do in chemistry. It was really more fun. We could read about, uh, actually, we always re read about viruses first, funnily now that we're in this pandemic. But um, we always ended up, the kids always ended up wanting to learn more about the paranormal. And the University of Virginia has a a fantastic program where they have scientists and doctors who study these things and it's totally acceptable. And I, I would show my students some video and we would do some readings from that. What was really interesting is they, they all, when they felt safe enough, they all ended up talking about either some experience they had, whether it was a dream or some crazy phone message or electricity, some electricity, electrical issues, whether it was them personally or somebody they knew in their family. And so it was, what I learned from that was we don't, we're, it's another thing going back to repression that was, that sort of repressed in our society. If you, when you end up bringing it up and with students, it was really interesting because you could tell they would be like, they'd sort of look around, like, should I actually talk? And once they started sharing it, it was almost everyone had some sort of experience, either themselves or with somebody that they were very close to. So I've had a couple. I think my, for me, the more profound experiences have been mostly with this psychic, this woman, Sophie, I knew for 30 years and through other readings that I've had. Is there a specific story you could share with us about one of your readings? If it's not. I, I think I've established here, Gavin, that nothing is too personal. <laughs> I, I mean, if you haven't gotten that from me yet, I, I don't. I don't, I don't know. I'm doing something wrong. I knew okay. I could count on you. I knew. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I have actually too many, but, but one of my favorite ones. I've got um, all the time in the world. I'm locked down in my house for the next couple of weeks. Yeah. I'm on your time in this one. So one of my favorite ones was a few years ago when my oldest daughter was pregnant with um, her first child. So my first granddaughter, she had had a miscarriage a few months before this pregnancy. And she was nervous, obviously. It was the first pregnancy. She was coming out of a miscarriage. Um, it was New Year's Eve. I was in Chicago with my father and Erica and her husband were here. She had an ultrasound. And then I got a call from her husband saying, oh my God, Erica, she's so, I have to call you. I have to talk to you. Erica's so hysterical. She can't even talk. The ultrasound technician had said something to Erica and Erica had interpreted it as there's some like large artery, enlarged artery in the baby's head. And uh, Erica eventually talked to me and she could barely, she was just so upset and distraught. And I was like, oh my God, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, artery in the head, that doesn't make any sense. So, you know, we talked for a little, I couldn't calm her down. I got off the phone. There are a number of people in my family who are doctors. I could have called any one of those people on New Year's Eve, but no, I called my psychic Sophie, which would probably horrify my family. And I called Sophie and I was like, Sophie, you have to help me. She was like, all right, fine. She laid down a couple cards. I couldn't see her in person, obviously. And um, she was like, the baby's fine. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the baby. But Erica can't have sex for two weeks. Something hasn't moved yet that needs to move. And her doctor needs to tell her she can't have sex for two weeks. The baby's absolutely fine. And she repeated this like 20 times. And I got off the phone and I felt relieved because I definitely believed Sophie. But I couldn't, I wasn't going to say to Erica, listen, Erica, uh, I didn't call any doctors, but I called my psychic. And my psychic is telling me that you can't have sex for two weeks. Like, no, that wasn't going to work. A couple of days later, Erica ended up seeing her doctor and her doctor said, the baby's totally fine. There's nothing wrong with the baby. And the, te the technician hadn't said artery. The technician had said artifact. An artifact is something that can come into a sonogram having to do with a sound wave. So it had nothing to do with the baby at all. But, you know, you're a nervous pregnant woman. And, and then the doctor said, but your placenta is still low lying. It hasn't moved up yet. It normally, it, it'll probably move in a couple of weeks. If you decide to have sex, you will probably have a little bit of, of bleeding. And it's meaningless. It's totally safe. 
But because you're who you are and you and if you do decide to have sex and you do bleed, just come in. I'll give you another ultrasound so I can reassure you. Of course, Erica did decide to have sex. Bled, had to go in and get another ultrasound. But it was what amazed me about this story with Sophie is the specificity of it. Like, you know, how she knew there was something that hadn't moved yet. How she knew about like the two week timeline. I mean, I just I just find that it just. It's amazing. And it really opened, not just then, I mean, I'd been seeing her for years and seeing other mediums and psychics, but it just opens up your mind and your heart to, I don't know, all the possibilities of, you know, who's still with us, who's still guiding us and helping us. And anyway, so that's one of my stories. Uh, and your daughter's name's Erica, yes? Yeah. I yes. hope you're enjoying the interview, Erica. You know, yeah. thank you very much for sharing <laughs> Well, thanks, Mum. I'm glad my dad isn't on a podcast. I dread to think what he was saying. It's not. But have you had any encounters with like ghosts or beings or spectres or UFOs? Have you ever had that little strange moment in your life that's made you ponder what has just happened? I mean, I've had moments, not in the way I wish. I, I mean, it's so funny that you ask that because my whole life, you know, I've always wanted to see a ghost. And people like laugh at me when I say that. I'm like, no, I, I want to have that experience and that connection, you know, because from what I've learned, in my, you know, sort of journeys, um, they're almost all very loving. And I know they're not, but like, I would love a loving encounter with spirit that, you know, I've had it through mediums and psychics who, you know, I know they've connected through, like, just through what I told you with the details that Sophie gave me, like, if you get those really concrete details, you know, you can't, it would be impossible for me to say, well, well, that was just luck. No, that couldn't have just been luck. And, you know, she did it over and over again. It wasn't just a one time thing. You know, that was just luck. I one day when the world is healed, come to Haverford West with your family. But I'll put you in some places and situations. Right. Where I hopefully am, I can I make am, It's funny because after reading your second book, I, I was like, OK, this place is amazing. You know, we're definitely coming there to visit because I I've read about it now and done a little bit of research. And so, yeah, it's it's a place where it does seem to have some paranormal activity. I'm going to lock you in a few places and see how okay. you feel about the paranormal after that. OK, OK, so, okay. Well, okay thank <laughs> you. <laughs> how do you feel that as a race we are dealing with mental health 80 years on? What is your message to anybody who's listening, watching right now who suffers from mental health illness? Number one, I mean, we've obviously come a long way. We have some, you know, we have great new medicines. We have great therapies. Don't give up would be my number one thing. Uh, I feel so lucky to live in, the, when, I, I, when I compare myself to my grandmother's sister, there weren't the antidepressant and anti-anxiety drugs at the time. So I feel so incredibly fortunate to live in a time where there are, you know, some really wonderful treatments. I, there, There's help out there. There's a lot of help. And if it doesn't happen right away, just don't give up. I mean, part of, for me, part of my depression was always, and many people, you know, depression comes with this feeling of hopelessness. That's part of what depression is. So it's easy to want to give up, but, you know, don't give up and you know, just really keep an open mind about getting help and talking about it and and shame on anybody who might humiliate you or say, like my father used to say, pull up your socks. Well, you know, that's crazy. Like, you know, hopefully you can know that they're wrong. That is such a powerful message and one I can relate to very, very much. How do you think Where Madness Lies, your truly superb book? We say that about all, all our books, but this is so relevant right now. A lot of what's happening now in the year 2021, what we've just been through, is spookily mirroring what was happening 100 years ago. You know, we've seen viruses, financial crashes, all kinds of political upheaval. What do you think where madness lies can help us with as we head into an uncertain future? I have this quote that I love, let only a closed mind is certain, right? So... Again, you know, it's about being open-minded. And what I think this book really tells a story of is 
the two main characters, which are based on my grandmother and myself, this ability to eventually and finally really understand and listen to each other. It also means that they each have to reflect. So in my case, in I thought my grandmother was sort of the wicked witch of the West when I was growing up. I mean, she was very rigid and critical and controlling and things that weren't always pleasant. And what I had to come to learn is to really understand why. You know, when I finally understood that this came from all the trauma that she had lived through, right? And then she also came to understand her feelings, you know, about me and the fear that, you know, maybe I was too much like Rigmore and maybe things would end up pretty horribly for me too. But that ability to really listen, to keep an open-mindedness, but to listen to each other. So one of the things that I find so sad in our country right now is, I mean, there are more than two sides, but there are, you know, basically these two sides that like hate each other. And it's just pointing fingers all the time. And it's not sitting down with the other side or sides and really learning and trying to understand and empathize. Like, why do you feel this way? Like, why do you feel that President Trump still won the election or whatever? Like, trying to actually sit down and understand where the other's beliefs come from. That to have that empathy, I think that's what we need always. Like, I don't think it matters when you live. It just really understanding the other person and the other side. I mean, that's going to carry us through an uncertain future because then, you know, again, easily we'll have love. So it's a beautiful dream and I hope it becomes a beautiful right. reality. <laughs> it no, it's not cheesy at all. It's something we need. <laughs> we get so much more done if we work together. Right. Exactly. Exactly. It's, it's inherent in us that we need to attack what's different. It's right. inherent. It's tribalism. You know, we see it everywhere. We see yeah. it in sports, politics, you know, right. religion, sexuality, color, creed, you name it, religion. And we need to work together. And we're just two people, two authors chatting on a podcast. And I do hope that tonight that if you're listening out there, you've realized that it's OK to feel the way you do. And it's OK to ask for help because there are people out there who will love you, will support you and, and to get you through this. Now, going back to something we touched a little bit on and for the podcast listeners as well. What is the significance of the pictures in the book? I know they're very, very important to you. So the um, the pictures are based on the, they're the real people. So and I love when you can, you know, when a, a story is based on real events, even though some of it's had to be fictionalized because I didn't know all the details. Um, but the bones of the story are true. And the pictures, I hope, you know, really show what these people look like. And hopefully I describe them well. You know, my grandmother was this amazingly beautiful woman, as was Rigmore. You know, and you get the sense even looking at these pictures of Rigmore. I mean, I think it's kind of important. I mean, she looks perfectly healthy. You know, it's not like she looks like, I don't know. I don't I don't even know what word to use, but... So you just see what what they look like. And hopefully that gives another layer of understanding and empathy again. Absolutely fantastic. Now, everybody, you are listening, you're watching Sylvia True, the author of Where Madness Lies. It is a truly superb book. The reviews have been phenomenal. It's going, it's going to be making some very, very big waves all across the world in 2021. It's a book that we need. It's a book that we need to read. We need to understand so that we don't make the mistakes of the previous generations before us. So Sylvia, where can people read Where Madness Lies? How can they contact you for more information? I do. I have a website, sylviatrue.com, and I love to talk to people. I think I've made that clear, right, Kevin? Um, So you can feel free to contact me. You can go to Amazon. You can go to the amazing publishing company of John Hunt, Barnes & Noble. I think you'll find it. It's going to be a big, big book. Where Madness Lies by Sylvia True. It is available from wherever books are sold. You can find it on Amazon, on Kindle, Barnes & Noble. You can head over to John Hunt Publishing or Top Hat Books and you will find this astonishing book. Read it, talk about it, share it, make it a part of your life, okay? Now, Sylvia, a little bit of a swerve question for you. Please, could you leave our audience with a final thought? Just something to leave them with. I think that we need to learn 
to really learn. I know we talk about this and we all believe it, but to really see that all people, all people are equal, regardless of your wealth, your handicaps, your mental health, we're all equals and really understand that. This is Sylvia True, author of Where Madness Lies. Read it, learn from it, understand it, and it can help you where you are in your life. Sylvia, thank you so much for your generous time. You've been amazing. Oh, thank you, Gavin. You're amazing and open. And it's so easy to talk to somebody when they're willing to be open too. So thank you. You are listening to the O People podcast. O Books aim to enlighten and inspire our readers. So change your life today and visit www.o-books.com for more spirituality, personal development, MBS and self-help titles. It's never too late to make positive changes to your life. So visit www.o-books.com today and explore a world of personal growth and positive teachings.